Welcome to your authentic path to powerful leadership with Marsha Clark. And we are here today with guest Sarah K. Ramsey. First of all, Marsha, welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here and welcome back to our listeners. Yes, yes, yes. So Sarah, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. I mean, we've got a special guest. So Sarah, I mean, I, or Marsha, well, you let me, introduce yeah, let her. Me, let me yeah. do the introduction. So Sarah and I have known each other actually a very long time. And so this is the, the secret backstory is that Sarah is a second cousin. So oh. you you probably didn't even know that. No. We? So uh, we we started a conversation several years ago now at this point about the kind of work that she wanted to do and look where it is all uh, evolved and landed and I love that. But what I want the audience and the, our listeners to know is that she is the best selling author of a book that's entitled Becoming Toxic Person Proof. Now get that again, Becoming Toxic Person Proof. And she also does a podcast uh, in support of that. And one of the reasons that I wanted to have Sarah on this, uh, on my podcast is we talk a lot about interpersonal relationships. And we all know that we have some toxic relationships and have had them, may be in the middle of them now. And I wanted her to come in and all the deep and good work that she's done around that. I want our, our listeners to hear about that uh, and know that she's a resource for them. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Marsha, you've shared on other episodes how you and your team have done months of due diligence and deciding topics and research and who's going to be on guests. And so I'm understanding that Sarah is also a graduate of the Sour Power of Self program, <laughs> That's correct? Right. That's yeah. Right. Well, I, I, th- here's what I will tell you. Almost. <laughs> oh. So, so this is the never-ending story of our final Class 20. So uh, we had one session left to do. COVID hit. Yeah. And we converted to virtual that which we could. And now every time, and we've rescheduled it multiple times. And every time we do something else happens and people can't get on planes oh, and come to, to. So she's an almost graduate, but I will just tell you, she could run her own program. So we're all good. That's awesome. That's <laughs> all right, awesome. Sarah, you get to yes, talk now. So now please, yeah. Sarah, please. Sarah, welcome. No, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, I grew up hearing that I was like this lady named Marsha and my grandmother would say gosh you act just like Marsha and I was like who's Marsha you know I was five or six years old and then I met Marsha as an adult and she was just such a gift to me I have so many women in my life um, who love being stay-at-home moms and, and they just love it and that's wonderful for them and I was just had this entrepreneurial mindset and wanted to run these things and create these things. And I, I did not fit in with so many members of my family. And when I met Marsha, I went, oh, <laughs> wow, we have a lot in common. So I'm so excited to be here. So true. That's yes. awesome. That's awesome. Well, one of the power of self um, teachings is learning boundaries and living out your truth. So let's start diving into today's topic. And the title of Better Pigs Don't Change Wolves is the title of this episode. And I cannot wait to hear where we're going with that. So <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I'd just like to say, you know, one of my, uh, when I hear, I've learned a lot from Sarah about toxic relationships. And so when I think about uh, how that ties in with my work, this boundary setting is clearly one of the, the significant ties, if you will. And I, I want our listeners to think about this phrase, this quote, if you will, um, that givers need to set boundaries because takers rarely do. Uh, and, spot on. And so when I think about the whole story around how we stay in toxic relationships, and we give and we give and we give and we give and we give. And we give. Thinking it's that'll very, fix it. It'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sarah's going to be talk, talk, talk to us a lot about that. But I, I want us to make that that connection and that by hearing what Sarah has to say and listening to her podcast, reading her books, you're going to get a whole lot of tips and techniques and tools to help recognize it, manage it, get yourself out of it. Exactly. Okay, so Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself. What led you to this work? Define a toxic relationship for us so three-part so question my <laughs> obsession yes my obsession with this conversation is making the language more simple okay okay and i'm a i have my uh, certification as a nlp master practitioner mm. so it's a neuro linguistic 
practitioner. Okay. So I'm obsessed around the language because toxic relationship that can be so broad. And what does that Mm -hmm. even mean? And is it a romantic relationship? Is it not? Is it this? Is it that? It just can get really confusing and it's too important of a Mm -hmm. topic Mm -hmm. to get wrong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So the way I define a toxic relationship is a relationship where both parties do not play by the same set of rules. Oh, wow. One person makes the rules. (laughs) One person enforces the rules. And that same person gets to break the rules or mm-hmm. change the rules depending on what mood they are in that mm-hmm. day. And and the other person is left trying to follow the mm-hmm. rules. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you can see why there are definitely toxic people of both sexes, but you can see why the way culture has defined what being a woman is and being a nice girl and, mm-hmm. and following the rules, you can see how, uh, this has had real consequences for women specifically um, as they grow up and grow right. into work and, and life and relationships. Well, and I also think about this idea of following the rules, being a good girl, coloring inside the lines. Those are all mm-hmm. metaphors for all of that. And we get rewarded for being that. Exactly. And so when we ha- are in a relationship with another person who is setting and defining and changing and enforcing and all those kinds of the rules, we're, we, we just think, oh, there must be something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not, I'm not doing it right. And, and the other person can often, whether, again, it's a boss, a neighbor, a family member, a, a, you know, a spouse, whatever it may be, it, it, it can get complicated fast. When you when you put that into all the social conditioning that women have long, you know, lived in, if exactly, you will. exactly. So, Sarah, I have a, a couple of notes here about a car blackout and Emma, and how that made you start this work. So, tell us that story. So it's always a running joke and people will say, um, you know, did you have a toxic relationship? And I say, "Mm, that's so cute. You think it's just one. (laughs) Um, If only I had been that smart earlier in my life. So uh, I was definitely uh, a professional people pleaser at other stages of my life. That good girl, that drawing inside the lines, that following the rules. Man, I just really thought as long as I got everything right, Mm -hmm. I could prevent bad things from happening or prevent my life falling apart or prevent pain. I could really prevent life from happening to me, which uh, I know so many other females identify with. And um, eventually it got to a point that I was people pleasing to such an extreme that I had three friends in the car with me. We were doing a girls weekend in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it was two in the afternoon. There were no, there was no drinking, there was no drugs, there was no prescription and pr- prescription drugs. And I just blacked out from stress while I was driving the car oh in my. downtown Charlotte with three of my best friends in the car with me. Three of us were mothers. It was incredibly dangerous. And it was just my body had finally shut down from the stress of that people pleasing, the stress of, well, do you think I'm doing the right thing? Do you think I'm okay? Do you, do you think this is the right decision? And uh, I mean, <laughs> to say being a people pleaser nearly killed me mm. is wow. a literal statement. Right, right. Mm. So, so that was number one wake up call. Okay. And then in my local area, there is a, a beautiful young girl named Emma Walker. And she was a high school student who was killed by her boyfriend, um, shot in her bed. Uh, um, And it received, you know, national attention. There's a dateline about it. You know, it just blew up into this terrible story, obviously. Um, But I knew Emma, Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't a story to me. It was a person. Mm -hmm. And I started a mental health campaign for teens after that to try to teach them some of these relationship dynamics uh, and and healthy relationship dynamics and healthy coping strategies and emotional health. And Marsha, I know you, you will understand what I'm saying when I say everybody always wants to say, Oh, we need to teach teens. Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we do, Mm -hmm. but even more importantly, we need to show teens. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And what I would see is a lot of people like, well, I know I'm not leading by example. I know I'm not making healthy relationship decisions. I know I'm depressed. I know I don't have boundaries, but I want my 
you know, daughter or son to be stronger than I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because which it, is an incredibly unfair expectation to put on a child. Yes, <laughs> I mean, right. It, it, incredibly unfair. So, so I switched from helping teens to helping their mothers. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and I want to say this, I, you, you know, I, you've heard me say this, Sarah, is they, you know, women at 45, 35, 55 asked me, where were you when I was 25? Well, you know, we've right. got to, we've got to have, I'll say the fully developed brain in order to make good choices and good decisions. And that doesn't happen until we're 25, 25, mm-hmm. 26 years old. So to think that a 15 or 16 year old is going to have all the answers and that they're going to take it all in and be able to process it as an adult would is a fallacy that, so I, I agree with your point. A- and the other point I I want to make around this we did a mother-daughter program many years ago and it was a pilot and you know it was it was working on both sides of that relationship and you know what what I remember about that is um the mothers wanted to do well but they're humans too mm-hmm. and you know the things we learned are why do girls have eating disorders because how many times did they hear their mother stand in front of the mirror and say i got to go on a diet or i've gotten too big or i mean our children are watching us i mean exactly. you know, sarah you grew up in an educational field and you know knowing that those little ears and eyes take everything in and people hear what you say people believe what you do, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that quote. And and so we do have to be models and we have to show them what mm-hmm. it looks like to, to, to do hard things when you're in bad relationships. Right, right. So Sarah, what surprised you when you began helping people rebuild their lives after toxic relationships? Well, I don't have to tell you guys that our world is changing in regards to stereotypes. And we are very... Um, trying to not just view someone by what their name is or where they grew up or what color their skin is. And that's wonderful. Um, But there is such a stereotype around toxic relationships Mm -hmm. that they only happen in maybe certain neighborhoods or with certain personalities. Um, And I have had clients graduate from Harvard. I have clients in the upper echelons of Microsoft. My most prominent job that I've had of my clients has been uh, female lawyers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, And I've worked with people from all over the world. And so there is just these people who are like conscious and they're wanting to play inside those lines and follow the rules. Um, And so I really want to point that out because sometimes we can assume and hope, well, toxic relationships will only happen to other people. They mm-hmm. don't happen to people like us. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm educated, if I my parents stayed together, if I go to church, I'm not, I don't have to worry about that. Right. And that's just not what um, my work has shown. I remember the first time I ever went to the women's shelter in Dallas uh, after I started doing some of this work and finding out more about what that what they did and how they did it and all that kind of stuff. And I remember coming back and it was the first time I'd ever heard the statistic that two in five households have domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, oh, I, I, it was a heavy weight to carry when you begin to see the stark reality of all of that. That's 40%. That's 40%. That's 40%. So what I did is I went back on, uh, on my back porch and I, I, I lived with a, I lived on a golf course and, mm-hmm. and, and it had houses that I could see you rows could see and rows. Them. And so I just went out there and just within my visual sight counted, okay, one, two, three, oh, four, five. Okay. One, two, three, oh, four, five. And there were 12 houses within my vision that had the potential and, and it was an affluent neighborhood. It, it's not a socioeconomic issue and it's not an, a geographical issue. It's not a race issue. Mm-hmm. It is an issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this idea of breaking down those stereotypes and thinking that I'm toxic proof already is a fallacy that we have to we have to acknowledge and there's degrees there's degrees of toxicity but right. we, we want to figure that out sooner rather than later mm-hmm. so i i can see how both of your work both of your sets of work are connected to each other because both of you point out um, this idea of there's different sets of rules for different groups of people. I mean, sometimes for you, Marsha, it's okay, the men have this set of rules versus Mm -hmm. the women. And Sarah is pointing out, okay, this issue of toxicity has no group of people that it lands on. Right, Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, here's what I'll say, Sarah, and I'd love to hear from you. The, the idea here is that uh, whether you call it, there's stereotypes about people, but there's also the uh, social conditioning that comes along with all of this. And right. there are also uh, organizational systems or institutions who either don't believe the woman when she tells you what she tells you or tells you that, you know, uh, you've got to stay in the marriage no matter what, mm -hmm. either because of pride, ego, standing in the community, or the nature of the institution itself. I, I was a part of a task force here in Collin County, uh, Texas, and it was the, a, a task force on, on family violence. And we had churches and police and hospital and different factions represented. And we discussed a lot about, and look, I'm, I'm all for religion and spirituality, and yet churches convince women to stay in relationships yes. long long after they need to be out and, and induce all the guilt feelings yes. associated with it. And then they gaslight, well, it's not that bad. Well, I, it happened to me. So if it happened to me, I'm justifying my own decisions. You know, you can live through it. You know, I mean, so there's all of that kind of stuff. And so Sarah's fighting to help people recognize it, understand it, and do something with it. And that's what we're doing in our work, my work as well. So that there's my connections here. I, right. I, I don't know. I'm sure you have lots of other things to say. Well, one thing I would like to say is mean, well, nice people don't pretend to be mean, mm. right? So if there's someone who is nice, I don't think, you know, I'm going to pretend to be mean today and see what happens and see, right. you know, that people, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And so within the, the conversation of who's telling the truth, mm -hmm. which is what you were addressing with when churches and that kind of thing, um, it, nice people don't pretend to be mean. Mean people pretend to be nice. Yes. And that. usually they that. are very, very good at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially, especially if you have a belief system. What people are fighting yes. against when they come out and say, this happened to me, okay, is this filter of if this person had been toxic, say it's a church situation, and a woman in this case comes forward and says, my um, husband is toxic there's a huge belief system that these women have to get through because the pastoral staff, whoever, friends and family members say, but if they had been acting that bad, I would have seen it. Right. Exactly. Right. Yep. Who's, who remembers Bill Cosby? Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Who remembers uh, Bernie, Bernie Madoff? Who mm -hmm. remembers Jeff Epstein? I mean, these people, um, Mel Gibson, I think, yes. has... Yes. In, been in trouble for you know these are all people who at one point we really admired mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. right and they and presented a face that we all fell in love with which which honestly if you're the woman in that situation you're even more isolated yes. because you know that no one's going to believe you because he's so charming around everyone else yeah well, absolutely and if anyone is in this situation and they think, Oh, I know someone who was in a toxic relationship. How do I know who was telling the truth? Because both people are saying the other one was toxic is, mm -hmm. is really normal. Really look and see who is getting the better end of the deal. Please go further with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go back to playing by the same set of rules, right? Right. If one person is making the rules, breaking the rules and forcing the rules, it's pretty obvious to see they are getting the better end of the deal. Yep. And it's really easy when, when you point it out that way. That's why I'm so obsessed with making this language more simple. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I have a note here about the phrase toxic person encounter. Is that the yes. same as a toxic relationship or is this something different? I talked to someone recently and they were trying to decide about a babysitter for their children. And there were several warning signs. Uh, this person didn't answer their phone. They were taking a nap from 12 to 7, so they were kind of asleep all day. And, you know, these are some warning signs, some red flags, okay, that this person may not be. Most functional adults are not sleeping all day. Right. She didn't, she didn't work a night shift. She wasn't a nurse. I mean, she was just 
like asleep all day, right? So that's a red flag. That's a concerning behavior that I would, when she asked me about it, I said, you know, I think that's weird, which is a phrase that's really important in this, in this work. That's, that's kind of weird. You think that's weird? And, and that's the way to keep yourself safe. And I love, that's a very recent example in my life. But when you talk about a toxic relationship, people assume they shouldn't marry an abuser. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. When you talk about a toxic person encounter, this woman is able to keep her children safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, and I, and I think too, Sarah, in the work world, uh, I'm going to choose a sitter or not choose a sitter. I'm going to choose a mate or not choose a mate. I don't always get to choose my boss or my coworkers or the culture that my organization represents. So that's like I'm being put into a situation that I didn't choose. And and that has yet another set of things to consider. So my next book is about what problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. Okay. Mm, So there is a very distinct strategy on choosing a babysitter or choosing a mate, right? There's specific strategies needed. And it's a different type of strategy if you are at work where there's a toxic coworker, a toxic boss. Um, So most of the time within that conversation, you're going to need coping strategies to get the stress, uh, protect yourself, obviously, in HR type of situations. And then also some real stress reset that can happen very quickly in the work setting. So if you get that toxic email, you're not carrying it home to your kids that night. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about that as another kind of encounter, Wendy, is is where I make that connection. So it can be a one-time interaction that I have with someone, never met them before, you know, don't know them, may or may not ever see them again. And yet the encounter here was extraordinarily toxic. And, And so there's the what choices can I make initially and then in the long run but then how do I respond in the moment right you know is another place that we need to need to search and and Sarah I I I know you often quote this and I do as well it's that I want to go back for a minute to the how do you recognize it so to me Mm -hmm. that Maya Angelou quote of if someone shows you who they are believe them right Mm. and and I think that you know we don't want to believe them because they have this persona that presents itself differently and then I think the other thing is women trusting our intuition because if if we're feeling that you know this isn't quite right or it's weird or you know this is not normal behavior or I didn't do anything that would warrant that kind of reaction or whatever it may be so I go back to listen <laughs> listen to your yes. body listen to your instincts listen to your intuition listen to that you know notice that red flag that's going up hmm yeah. Bill Eddy, he talks about the nine, uh, the five types of people who will ruin your life. He runs the High Conflict Institute, brilliant man in this work. Um, and he says if nine out of ten people wouldn't do that, mm. then there's your, you know, that, that can Signal. be some data around. If you're uncomfortable at this time trusting your intuition, that can be a question you might ask. Like that woman asked me, she said, do you think this person is safe to have around my kids? And I said, you know, nine out of 10 people aren't sleeping all day and then not answering their phone when they were supposed to babysit. Exactly. That's odd behavior. And it starts to become a pattern of behavior. Uh, Marsha, you have a three dot. Yes, yes, yes. What what is that? A dot is a dot. Two dots is a line. Three dots is a trend. So if, if it happens, it's a pattern. Exactly. And so if the that's weird, huh, something's off, huh, and then, you know, nine out of 10 people wouldn't do it. Um, that's a real framework that you can kind of clamp down on. Sometimes trusting your intuition can feel scary or feel like, I don't know what that looks like right. yet. But if you notice three that's weirds, or uh, mm-hmm. then there's that line, there's mm-hmm. that pattern that mm-hmm. you can start to make decisions from. Yep, yep, yep. So Sarah, how do we balance protecting ourselves and yet still giving people the grace to make mistakes? Because none of us are perfect, mm-hmm. but. Well, absolutely. And really coming with a clean slate. There are some people who assume everyone's horrible. That's the framework that they see the world from. Yeah. And they go, oh, everyone's terrible. And they, they assume everyone's bad and they're looking for what's bad. And then there's some people who are like, oh, la dee da everybody's nice. Everybody's good. Everybody's doing the right thing. And both are equally dangerous. 
for different reasons. Yeah. Okay. And I like to uh, have, obviously, that Maya Angelou quote is so important. And I, I think about is a framework of a healthy person can crack open a door and see what's on the other side. An unhealthy person never opens the door because they're afraid, mm. they're protective energy, uh, they assume everyone's terrible. Um, and another type of unhealthy person has the door swung open all the time. Whoever wants to can come in, no matter what your behavior is, I'm going to assume that you didn't mean it every time you do, so, <laughs> you know, whatever that behavior is. And so if you can really think about cracking the door and just looking outside, what does your behavior say that you are? Mm. Yeah. Not a one-off bad day. Remember with that pattern? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Trends. Everybody has a, a bad day. But there's a very distinct difference in a dog who bites you once and a dog who bites you daily. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, I want to tie this back to our trust work because uh, when I, what, it, what Sarah said harkens me back to that. So some people in trust, building trust. Some people start at zero and trust no one and they have to prove cumulatively over time that I can trust you others and and they're the ones who don't open the door or man it takes a long time for them to open that door yeah there are the other people that are one they start at 100 I trust you absolutely until you demonstrate elsewise and so that's the subtracting factor and that's the people that leave the door wide open and it, it, it's like anything strength taken to an extreme can become a weakness is when I trust everybody I can get burned mm -hmm. I can you know that can be viewed as naive or Pollyannish or man you're a trusting soul scarcity versus abundance I mean all of those are words to your NLP point all of those are words that we can connect to and recognize and so whether it's how much we trust others how much how little we trust others and how does that show up in in how I move forward in a relationship with anyone right right well I know that some people in toxic relationships are often given well-meaning advice of ju <laughs> just put up some boundaries honey mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know and and but it sounds like it's way more complicated than that because especially if you've been if you're if the toxic relationship is a marriage and right. you've been married for 10 years 20 years you can't just undo that with a simple you know a couple of a couple of Oprah shows and a <laughs> and a eat pray love book like really you no, got, it, you it goes beyond that so Sarah talk to us about that how do you, how do you help someone or if someone is listening and saying hey yeah I've got a toxic relationship going on in my life what are some steps so I think the conversation around boundaries is so important because what I see is women going to counselors, going to therapists, and they say, well, you should be more assertive. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be a doormat. You should have boundaries. Who is at fault in that conversation? The woman, 100%. Always. Absolutely. Yep. Right? Yep. And so... Yes, she should have boundaries, right? And I hate the should word, but yep. we all need boundaries, right? It's like we should drink water. Um, yes. You know, we all should have boundaries. But what I don't want is to blame people who have been hurt by toxic people and say, oh, I know the toxic person has said everything your fault is your fault. And let's add, let's add something else that's your fault, too. Can, exactly. Can, can I add something else to make you feel bad? Um, and, Marcia, you talked about, both and statements a lot, right? So it's it's both having boundaries and not taking responsibility for someone else's behavior. Yeah, this is the either or versus the both and, and it's ambiguous and it's paradoxical and it's contradictory and it's hard and you got to balance both sides. I, I, I love this person. I, I want to be in a relationship with them. And, you know, it is not a mutually respectful relationship or we love him by two different rules or he always wins, I always lose. You, you, you know, there is a both and side mm -hmm. to that. And, yes, we need to have boundaries. And, you know, when I talk about boundaries, it's not just setting them. We have to maintain them. <laughs> we, right. have to, we have to be serious and real about it. But this idea and, and the word should, you, you know how, how I feel about that. It's one of my trigger words. And, you know, I think about should. Should is could with shame on it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I even would change the word should to you could set boundaries, 
because that's giving me an option and mm-hmm. it's not shaming me to mm-hmm. your point about, let me mm-hmm. add one more thing you're screwing up because you're already in this downward spiral, right? The erosion of self-esteem and self-worth and self-image and all of those things is deteriorating if, if we just let those top relationships live day in, day out, day in, day out. And so, you know, even it, think of it as a choice point. Mm-hmm. That's what could prepares you for right should as as we we both say is is that the shame shameful. guilt criticize embarrass diminish demean all of the words <laughs> that are not good words that right. none of us want to feel right. in that regard and so the choice point and the could possibility as well as both and yeah and I just want to layer on this as well you know, for those of us, and I'm sure, Sarah, you have experience with this, and I know you do, Marsha, women who have been in abusive, not just toxic, but have gone on to abusive relationships, he never just hits you. Mm. You never start, you start dating this awesome guy, and y'all date for months, and then you get engaged, and you're engaged for months, and then you get married, and everything is perfect and blissful, until one day, he just walks out of the bedroom, walks right up to you in the kitchen, and just gives you a black eye that never happens this idea of expecting women to have boundaries around toxic relationships is so hard because they've been dripped on at first it was just oh you're not going to wear that blouse in front of my Mm -hmm. boss are you Mm -hmm. and it, it starts with these tiny little paper cuts and then you get used to that and then it builds up to a a demeaning conversation in front of other people. And then you get used to that. It's so my point is that this is a building thing for people who are in toxic relationships. It's not just a splash of cold water. It's a drip, drip, drip that has built to where you wake up typically years later and you don't recognize yourself. Right. You don't recognize the fact that you don't have boundaries. And the entire time you've been trying to fix it right. by behaviors that you think you can do in order to just make it like it was in the beginning. You know, Sarah, you mentioned Jeffrey Epstein a moment ago. And, and when I think about the line of work that he was in <laughs> yeah. and many like him. It's grooming. It's grooming. It's that's grooming. exactly what I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I think that's the right word. You know, I'm preparing you to be who I want you to be. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. What's well, grooming? And then, Wendy, I would also like to say, by the time they hit you, yeah. that's like stage four cancer. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay? And I don't think any of us are like, want stay. My, my cousin is having, uh, not related to Marsha, my other side of the family, is having um, her second breast cancer surgery today. <sighs> Okay. She is less than 40 years old and is having her second breast cancer Mm -hmm. surgery, maybe as we speak. Right. I mean, but it's today. Okay. So if we looked at her and it's like, well, but it's not terminal. At least it's not terminal. At least he didn't hit you. Yeah. Right. If we're only having the cancer conversation when it's at a stage four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have really missed the boat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Right? I, I'm, I'm a fat, you know, the, the that's weirds, the three patterns align. Some of these things are, I, I'm really passionate about pointing out the precancerous cells. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we can start to get in some <laughs> cancer prevention, you know, toxic person prevention. Right. Rather than only having these conversations when it's stage three or stage right. four. Because I don't want any type of cancer. Right. I don't want any type of toxic relationship. Right, right. And so this idea of doing the work in the in the pre-stage, I hear this sometimes from friends or friends of friends or you just hear about it. The phrase, I know this relationship is complicated, <laughs> but surely it isn't toxic. Like, you know, he just insults me in front of everybody else, but just 50 percent of the time, you know, not 100 percent of the time, because then he'll turn and bring me flowers or be sweet or whatever. And so, I'll never do it again. And he'll <laughs> promise to never do it again. So what what do I do if or what what should our listeners do if if that's if that's what's going through their head i know this relationship is complicated but surely it isn't toxic 
do you play by the same set of rules? You ask yourself that question. Yep. 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 No. Right. right. I mean, th- there it is. Yeah. If you were, okay, so he's allowed to insult you in front of his friends. What if you insulted him in front of your oh, friends? Would that be the same? Would that be okay? Man, <laughs> that would be, yeah. Yeah. That would probably right? be, yeah. And that's where it can, that's where the, do you play by the same set of rules is so effective because it's not a conversation of physical abuse. It's not a a narcissism checklist. It's not a list of red flags. What happened if you did what he did? Yeah. Yeah. Would that be okay? And if you are so afraid to do to him what he's done to you, wouldn't you say? I mean, that's another that's like a gigantic red flag, hello. Red, flag, red flag because yeah. you recognize and yeah. you, you won't even go down that path because you you have great fear. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take us a, a, on an aside for just a minute. So last night, you know, I'm not a big TV watcher, but if I see something that someone's recommended or whatever, so someone had recommended to me there's a it's a it's some show about Hugh Hefner and the Playboy Bunny and how it all got started and what's coming out now, and you know what many saw as the objectification of women and blah 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 and he was just he was helping women be free and liberal in a time where you know feminism was great and he would go on these talk shows and he would just talk about how what a supporter he is of women and Hugh Hefner was nothing more than a 15 year old boy living out his you know childhood fantasies and he never grew up and then what was even more fascinating to me. I only saw two episodes of it. But, you know, the second one, he would have all these male friends on there who would talk about, well, he's not objectifying these girls. You know what, friend, male friend? You don't get to decide that. Yep. Right? And that's another way that toxicity plays out is I get to define how you think. I define how you feel about things. I convince you that everything we're doing is exactly right. And if you somehow deny that or act out in in my words inappropriately to diminish me like I'm doing that to you and these women that are coming back out now who are speaking about how isolated they were how ritualistic he was and this woman wrote one of the playboys of the month or whatever wrote this book and was about to go on a tour and he just very nicely said, well, I'd love to know what interviews you're going to do. And so she was set to go to New York the next day, and she had this long list of interviews she, she was going to do. So guess what? She got to every every single one of them, and something had been, happened and been canceled. You know why? Because Hugh Hefner had cameras all over that place, and he had blackmail on everybody. And you talk about a master manipulator. And guess who was on one of the – who was on this? Bill Cosby. Mm-hmm. Playing tennis. But, but Marsha – Who's making the rules? Right. Exactly. Those, he's like, oh, right. these, exactly. these women are so free. Are they, are they the ones no. making the rules or is it here? No. Yeah. No, it is. Right? It was. I mean, that's what made me think about tying it into what you just said was I was thinking about mm-hmm. the grooming that he did, that they had a nine o'clock curfew, that they could never go out with their girlfriends. And if you were going to tell anybody any story about it, he was going to control the story because that was the rules. Mm-hmm. And so... Again, this, this, I'm, I'm doing it with the, this narrative and story, and this is why women have to tell the story. And, and Sarah, I, when I think about your work as well, it's tell somebody, right? Don't, don't think you're alone in this scenario. If it's a girlfriend or mother and as listeners, we need to not just be supportive and convince them to stay or convince them it's not all that bad or, but what would you do without him or all of those kinds of things? It really is. How do we get you out of there? Yep. And as a friend and a colleague or a mentor or a pastor or a counselor or a coach or therapist or whatever, we have to listen and believe. Yes. I mean, well, and, and if I may, Marsha, if we, if these playboy girls, for example, come to us and I say, well, why don't you just stand up to Hugh Hefner? Right. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> Out of a job. But that's where boundary. It, Ostracized. Exactly. And that's where I, yep. Bringing it back to the conversation around all these women who are trying to get help. And someone says, be more assertive. Don't be a doormat. Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid of conflict. Stand up for yourself. Have better boundaries. Yeah. Like that's exactly why it's so ludicrous. Right. Yeah. I mean, it can be a safety issue. Yeah. It can be a they're going to 
spread terrible rumors about me. Um, and, and when you think about the story of the three little pigs, because remember, yes. we're at better pigs. That's right. Our better pig stories, okay? Yes. So um, when you think about the story of the three little pigs, one little pig had straw boundaries. Mm -hmm. One little pig had stick boundaries. And one little pig had brick boundaries. Which one of the little pigs changed the big bad wolf? The brick one. No, no. Oh. Not, none of them, really. Oh, hello. None of them. Great question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because the behavior on the part of the wolf was Did to eat change. them. And just because he couldn't blow the house down. But he's bringing TNT next time. Yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. And... I think that's just a really important point to point out because I see a lot of people get equipped with better boundaries and they think, okay, I'm going to stand up to Hugh Hefner. I'm going to tell him he can't do this to me. I'm going to tell him or whoever it is in their life. And then it goes badly again. It's like that the pig saying, awesome. Now I have, now I have brick boundaries and it worked. So now that the, the, Big Bad Wolf knows that I'm not going to give in to him, then his personality will change, and now we can be friends. Right. It's like, what? No. What? It's, no, to, Mar no. to Marsha's point, next time he just brings dynamite, or he has somebody else ring the doorbell and you come outside. I mean, there's <laughs> all, those that, things. all the things, all right. the manipulations that happen, even yeah. when you change your behavior. And again, I, I just want to point out that, yes, it's still you are the pig expecting the wolf to change. Or, and I do want to point this, this out, you could open the door the big bad wolf could stand in front of the door. When you open it, the big bad wolf says you hit them with the door. The big bad wolf is laying on the ground crying and the police show up and say, or the church pastor shows up or whoever it is. And they're just like, oh, the pig abused me. Oh, look, I got hit by the door. It's like, why were you at the door? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Because that is important. We've talked about a lot of, um, I call it victim and hero. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about the hero behavior, like Hugh Hefner, Bill Cosby, these people who are like almost bigger than life. Well, if that doesn't work yeah. and they're still trying to avoid change, the big bad wolf could also swoop into victim behavior. If the TNT doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. Maybe people's sympathy will work. Right. Uh, but, but the whole point of boundaries is not to change wolves it is protect to protect you. pigs it's to protect you right. not to change them yeah i want to i want to add on a couple of points because here's the other thing that happens well people say well what did you expect when you went to the playboy mansion what, what did you think when they made you wear that silly little uniform? <laughs> you know, you're the one that agreed to this. And this is like when women get raped or molested, it's the, well, you shouldn't have been drinking. You shouldn't have worn that. You shouldn't have gone to that party. You should have known when he grabbed you and drug you into the bedroom what was going to happen. You ask for it. And that's where institutional and societal rules need to change. Yeah. Or the it's not that bad, or he's not really doing that, that is gaslighting at its finest. Yeah. Because it's I, I'm feeling it, and yet you're telling me it's not there, and so you're trying to make me crazy. And, 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 and gaslighting makes you crazy. Yes. Because you start to believe it, and that's how that downward spiral begins to exactly. you know, devolve, devolve, devolve. And so I, I think these points are really good because that sympathy versus the hero, it can go either way. And unfortunately, society lets each one of those work mm -hmm. on behalf of the perpetrator. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I, I saw something, a friend of mine posted something, and, and I love this woman dearly. She's a friend of mine on Facebook, and she posted a, an image of a 12-point checklist for how women should walk from the grocery store to their car at night. It was be aware of your surroundings. Look over your shoulder. But once you pop open the trunk of your car, make sure no one is near you. It was this 12 point, it was all of this. All of these women were responding back, oh my God, thank you. Thank you for posting this. I never even thought about that. I thought, I didn't think about this either. Thank you for posting this. I was the only person who said, I think this is shameful that women have to exist in fear. I can't even walk from the door of the grocery store to, my, to car. my car in a parking lot without being afraid of them. That is sad. That is pathetic and wrong. 
and but and and, and yeah. my comment got no likes. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, but it's like I'm going to live my life looking over my shoulder or with a nervous twitch you exactly. know, because exactly. something's going to happen to me and everybody's out to get me. And unfortunately, there's enough evidence to show that you should pay, yes. pay attention to your surroundings and do yes. all those things. And it, and yet, remember when I spoke about there's a gentleman and his name escapes me, but in my one of my earlier podcasts I talk about, we talk about teenage pregnancies we don't and and it's all about the girl yes. we don't talk about the man who got her pregnant right you know or, or well and the grooming every that woman knows that. well every woman knows someone who's been raped yes, yes. How, many how many men know a rapist yeah not many because <laughs> they ain't talking and and even if even if it's not that extreme sarah it'll it, they'll still cover for them yeah they'll still cover mm-hmm. for them I mean, and Mm -hmm. that's the, and and we do too, we as women. Well, boys will be boys. Well, that was just locker talk. No. Signal, signal, red flag, red flag. Yeah, yeah. So, Sarah, what if someone who's listening today is in a relationship that's violent, where it's difficult to deny that it's happening? Do those people usually Mm -hmm. recognize that they're in a toxic relationship or is it, is it that something really bad has to happen where they finally... Well, if I could change one thing about human behavior, I think it would be that we didn't wait till stage four cancer or rock bottom right. to make changes. Right. You know, I mean, it's like I hear so many women and they say, well, I told myself if he ever hit me, then I'd be gone. Mm-hmm. And OK, so that's the that's let's pretend that's the rules of society. OK, as long as he doesn't hit you. Which many church people say, okay, well, he didn't hit you, right? That that hard, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so okay. So is that Marsha? I know you have a um, a young granddaughter. Mm-hmm. Would you be comfortable mm-hmm. me coming to her mm-hmm. class mm-hmm. and saying these are the rules of relationships? These are the rules of romantic relationships. This is the rules of marriage. As long as they don't hit you, you're good to go. You don't get to mm-hmm. leave. Mm-hmm. No, of course not. Right? I of mean, of course I wouldn't be okay with that. Well, of course not, but how many 43-year-old women have, women have been told that? Yep. Like, we keep changing the rules. That's right. Well, well and, and I'll uh, go another step that says, uh, for men, it's about power over, right? So when I talk mm-hmm. about power, it's about me having, you know, a hand to, to force you to be stay in this place right to I, I put you in that place I want you to stay in that place and if you try to get out and and this idea about I, I what I have read so much about is that women who are personally abused it often takes when the the abuser moves to their children so yes I can I'm going to do this for me but I wouldn't want you know this he's not going to do this to my children so I have to get out or I I, I know a a woman who just wrote a book about incestual sexual impropriety. And when she finally talked to her mother, it was like, well, I figured if he was doing it to you, he wouldn't do it to other kids because her mother knew her mother knew or this or the stepdad who's doing it. And the mother loves the dad and she believes the husband rather than believing the children. I mean, there's so much stuff and this is the complicated, right? This is, but, but I love Sarah's simplicity around, you know, uh, who makes the rules, who gets the better end of the deal. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, no matter how much you change, he's not going to change. I, Margaret Wheatley in, in leadership in the new science and, and her eight fearless questions, work she says can you allow them to do the work that is theirs to do I don't have to take that on because he's not going to change because of me he's got to change from his inside out not because of an outside in yeah yeah Marcia, Marcia, in my new book uh, with the framework for decision making and problem solving one what problem are you trying to solve two is it your problem to solve we would solve every codependency issue in the entire world Yes. Right. And I, that simplicity, um, it, because so often people assume they have to solve the problem of someone else's mm-hmm. bad moods or someone else's anger. And I want to be very strategic in saying that toxic people don't have anger issues. They have control issues and they use your ang- They use their anger to control right. you. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that's why 
if they, that's why you talked about uh, Bill Cosby didn't rape people in front of his other, you know, I don't really know, you know, maybe he did it somewhat, but there, he wasn't doing it on his TV right, show. Right, with right, I know that. Okay. Um, so he, he could control yeah. himself. He could when he chose to. In, in, in public, he can right. control himself. He can control his, uh, manage his image in public. And so if someone is with someone that um, they say, oh, well, he just has anger issues. Well, is he angry in front of his mm -hmm. pastor? Is he angry in front of his boss? Is he angry in front of your father or your family members? Or is he only angry in private? Good point. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. Then you know he knows right. what he's doing. Yep. It's manipulation. The master manipulator. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to shift mm -hmm. gears yeah. a little bit. I'm going to ask the question, what is smart girl syndrome? <laughs> we have been talking about smart girl syndrome this whole time, and Marsha <laughs> has so eloquently <laughs> set me up for success here. Uh, but she kept talking about that blame shifting, right? So I wouldn't get so mad if you behaved a certain way. I wouldn't have to... Um, mistreat you if you weren't doing xyz i wouldn't have had to cheat on you if you had come home on time i wouldn't have had to throw that if you had worn the shirt i told you to whatever it is and so smart girl syndrome is willing to do the being willing to do the work of the relationship yeah. okay but when i was learning how to play piano growing up I didn't expect to just automatically know how to play Beethoven. I put the work in over and over and over. When I was in school, I earned the grades. I put the work in. I didn't just assume I was going to make an A at the end of calculus. I had to put the work in to secure an A at the end of calculus. Okay. So I want to talk about how dangerous this concept is in a toxic relationship, but how beautiful and wonderful and powerful and uh, fabulous it is in all the other areas of life. If something isn't working, we work harder until we get the results we want. That's considered a high mm -hmm. achiever, not a victim of abuse or someone right. stupid right. or I can't believe this doormat ended up in a toxic relationship. Right. right. Absolutely. Right? This no. Is no, you're absolutely right. What we all have That's done right. to be That's successful. Right. That's right. Re that that performance in a in 99 out of 100 parts of our lives is rewarded rewarded well and i i have positive consequences yeah absolutely so, absolutely. so why would right. we not use that same line of thinking to try and fix if our relationship seems right we're gonna fix it we're gonna get in there and fix it okay so absolutely i don't give up i'm mm -hmm. strong enough right. to take it I'm not going to let this get the best of me. I'm not going to be the one who got right. divorced, right? But then we end up doing all the work of the relationship. Yeah, to the point where it almost completely destroys you. Mm -hmm. Well, Absolutely. you get thick skinned and, and it's another part of the drip, drip, drip. Yes. Well, he got better for a week. Oh, well, next time it was eight days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it yeah. goes back to that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's like, <laughs> you know, this is such a trivial comparison, really. But it's like when you put somebody on a performance improvement plan, anybody can make it through 30 days. Anybody right. can make it. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I, I love that example. No, that, that's perfect. And I do want to point out there's a fabulous book called The Asshole yes. Survival. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, which, which talks about toxic relationships at work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I really, in my own work, I'm so. Everyone assumes I only talk about romantic relationships, and I'm so passionate about this is just like a human problem. People can get taken advantage of. They can everywhere. have those toxic person yeah. encounters in everywhere, right? And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about that is because it does help people who have had toxic family mm -hmm. dynamics mm -hmm. forgive themselves, right? And it in the Asshole Survival Guide, they talked about uh, toxic relationships at work. And it's like, okay, I know this person's being terrible at work, but I'm going to keep putting up with it. I'm going to be strong enough to take it. I'm not going to let it get to me. I'm going to do pull that smart girl mm -hmm. syndrome thing until it, until it almost mm -hmm. kills you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Yeah. This. And for any 
No, no, I was just going to say it goes right back to the control component of this is that, you know, and and even withholding can be an ultimate form of control. So I'm not going to I'm going to withhold things from you. I'm going to withhold full information. I'm not going to let you get exposed to the outside world to recognize that most people don't live this way. And I'm going to give you just enough to make you feel lucky to be here. Right. Yep. Yep. So I'm not going to give you the best deal. I'm not going to give you the best promotion. I'm not going to, I mean, it's not yeah. different, right? I mean, it is, it's the same thing. And um, for anyone who's listening, who is in management position, one of the um, tips and tricks for protecting your workplace against toxic people is kind of putting them all on the same team. Uh, kind of intuitively we think, okay, I need to spread them all out, but then you have like, made your whole work culture toxic and your best people are getting burned out. And so actually, if you put them kind of all on the same team, they just keep <laughs> each other off and maybe that team isn't that effective, but you're not losing all your employees in a time now where employee retention is like, oh, so yes. important. Um, you can really protect your best employees. By I love that. Them put them on the there. island. <laughs> you, you know, I yep. it's like the island yep. of misfit toys, right? <laughs> but I love, the, I love the idea of that and I haven't even thought of it in those terms and you know where my mind then goes as a person who's led a lot of teams is that and then say we no longer need this team you're right, <laughs> right. well or you can you can right? hope that it's the agatha christie and then they were none novel that yeah, they all yeah. kill each other <laughs> off <laughs> well and likely they will either, yeah. either by running each other off and because you know this idea of when we see something coming at us you know boy what a what a volatile, you know, environment that that will create. But I love the idea because if it's everywhere, you're now creating an organizational culture that, uh, and, and again, when you have the nice cultures that don't want to deal with hard things, then it just takes on a life of its own. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sarah, in your book, Becoming Toxic Person Proof, you interviewed several hundred women about things they ignored. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about that? <laughs> Absolutely. And I call it the blind okay. spot chapter. Um, when you think about people who fall in love with potential, gosh, I know oh. that they're, you know, there's there's just so much potential in them. Or maybe we do want to hire people with potential, but that could actually translate into a work situation too. Well, I know they got let go of their last job, but with my coaching, with my management, with my leadership, I can transform them. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, <laughs> you know, but um, all these excuses for behavior, they didn't mean it. They're just stressed out. Things will get better when he retires. Things will get better when COVID's over. Things will get better when the economy changes. Um, there's just so many blind spots that if you are a good, kind, loving, giving person, you can get trapped into. And all I want to say is crack open that door and look with as clean of a slate as you can to what their behavior is really doing and what that pattern is showing you, not making those internal excuses. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is a, it's a courage of conviction to acknowledge my reality. And I got to be really brave and strong. And, and so if you have any inkling or any notion, you know, just say, how are you doing? You know, yeah. what, what's going on? Want to want to go for coffee? I mean, something that allows them to open up and get the help that they need to get out of that scenario. Right. And, and you know, part of that is pl planning your next career move or your next personal move. So to your point, there, it's not just romantic relationships. This can happen in a lot of different exactly. places. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, yeah, but it's making me think of bullies at work, yeah, honestly. Yeah. yeah. So, Sarah, your new book is about decision making and problem solving, right? So, tell us about that. Absolutely. Do you have do you have dates on when it's coming out? Title? Any of that? Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm playing around okay. with titles still. Now, what's interesting in this conversation is how some people identify with the words decision making and some people identify with the word mm. problem solving. So my current title, and it's usually very distinctly one or the other. Um, so my current title is getting unstuck simple strategies for complicated okay. problems um, or decisions trying to decide. Uh, but that is uh, 
when other people see toxic relationships, there's a lot of other people in the work of toxic relationships where it is really about, um, you know, should I stay? Should I go? You know, these, these, these types of very, very complicated decisions and complicated problems to solve. And, you know, when we think about flame retardant material that was developed in the military because it was like life right. or death. Those are life or death things that needed to be uh, created. Um, and that's how I think about this framework. You know, for the last four years, I've been helping women with these really, really complicated problems and decisions that sometimes have life or death consequences. But then they started using these same strategies at work. They started using these same strategies in other areas of their life, and they were getting promotions. They were getting raises. They were, and I was just like, huh. You know, maybe maybe these strategies are going to work in some areas that aren't quite so complicated right. or life or death. Um, and so that's really what this book is about. Um, so getting to my editor March 7th, it will be out sometime awesome. this year. Uh, and one of my favorite problem-solving strategies is the around the house okay. method. Yes, Can I tell please. you guys about that? So I want you to imagine you're going to a party in the backyard. Okay, there's a backyard barbecue, Texas barbecue, backyard barbecue. And um, so you get out of your car, you go to the front door, and you knock. And there's your toxic person, toxic coworker, toxic partner, whatever, behind that front door. And they say, no, I'm not going to let you in. And you knock again. You say, well, this isn't fair. You should let me in. And they say, no, I'm not going to. No one wants you here. You didn't even get invited to this party or whatever gaslighting they may throw on you. Um, I see a lot of people, if I ask them at that point what problem they were trying to solve, they are typically going to say, I'm trying to get this person to open the door. But what was the original problem they were trying to solve? Or what was the original goal? To get to the goal? party. Exactly. Right. And so there's a very different strategy to getting to that backyard right. party. But if, you know, a toxic person creates obstacles or a school system creates obstacles or some political thing creates obstacles, whatever it is, that it's a very difficult obstacle to overcome, I would see people switch and they would get so emotionally flooded and they would say, I need to get this person to open the front door. And it's like, no, you need to get to the party in the backyard. Yeah, which might mean walking around right? the side of the house and going in the gate. Mm-hmm. Walking around the house. Or you could get a helicopter right. to fly you in. You could climb a tree and jump in. You could hire a cheerleading team and create a pyramid and they could basket toss you over. There are so many creative solutions if you're solving the right, right and, and if you're staying focused on the problem, not the person who's blocking the front door. Look at all the places you're free. Right? Yes. It's like the, it's like a foot is yeah. nailed to the floor and you say, I can't move. Yeah, you can. You can move the other foot. You can move. You can wave your arms. You can do your bends. And you yeah. Know, so know where your freedoms lie is part of what I get to. The other the other image that comes to me, we had a woman um in, in one of our earlier Power of Self programs, and she was a minister at um, uh, the Unity Church in Dallas at the time. And she wrote a book called Hell in the Hallway. Okay, mm. so now let us let me tell you why what you're saying. You use a lot of doors, the, you know, the, the wolf knocking on the door, trying to get, to, th- you know, the up, through, the, through the, the door to the other side of the party, all that kind of stuff. Hell in the Hallways was, I'm living in hell. <laughs> right. And there's a door that I can open to get out of it. But then I go into the hallway and there's 17 doors. Right. And so we're trying to figure out which of those 17 doors I want to now go in, what room I want to go into. And and the whole point here is just go in a door. Right? Yeah. This is the no such thing as the last choice because there's always a next choice. But your first choice has to be open the door and get in the hall. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, am, am I am I making the right connection, Sarah? Yes. Yes, Marsha. I think we're exactly aligned on that. The way I describe it is a puzzle. And if you're trying to make a puzzle, it doesn't matter if you pick all the dog pieces and match them together or pick all the rainbow pieces or do all the edges and corners. It just matters that you start. And so Mm -hmm. just like your analogy, if you... If you're in hell, (laughs) you better find a door. You better find the first one that's going to open for you. Right. Right. Yeah. 
I, I do love that. And and I think the, uh, you know, the 5,000 piece puzzle is the complicated part, right? Because <laughs> it can be very, very complicated. And yet you got to, you got to make that first step. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I know that we've covered a ton of topics today <laughs> and we've just been scratching the surface. So Marsha, can you kind of wrap us up here with what key takeaways are? And then I'm going to throw it to Sarah to give her key takeaways for today. Yeah, I think for me, the key takeaways is recognize when you're in a toxic relationship and that it's not just romantic relationships, that it's work relationships, family relationships, neighbor relationships, whatever it might be. So and and the other thing I would say is really get clear about what the signals are and hear those and trust your gut on that. And I know we as women, we, we, we're often told, oh, well, it's not fact based or it's not evidence based or whatever. If it's in you, t- listen. Right? Yes. Listen to that message and then get the help that you need because there are steps and tools and techniques. And what the other big point I would want to say is to all of our listeners is be there for someone else if they need you. Um, you know, answer the phone, drop the email. You may not know exactly what needs to get done, but sometimes the person just needs to tell their story and then you can go figure it out together. So those are my big keys for today. Mm-hmm. Sarah? Well, and I want to point out that idea of patterns. Right. So is there a pattern of someone always getting the best end of the deal? Is there a pattern of someone making up all the rules and then changing the rules to is there a pattern of them using their anger when they want control back? Is there a pattern of them behaving one way in public and one way in private? Um, And is there a pattern if it's a new situation, those precancerous cells, is there a pattern of huh? that's weird? That feels off. I think I like nine it. out of 10 right. people would not do that, right? These are the real ways that you can keep yourself safe. And please, 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 if someone comes and says, my relationship's toxic or I'm in an abusive situation, and it's like, man, I, they seem this way, right? They seem Bill Cosby. They seem Jeff Epstein. They seem Hitler started off. People didn't know. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. There was the prime minister who met with Hitler and thought he's not that bad. Right. And he's a prime minister. These aren't stupid people. Um, So I really look to see who's getting the good end of the deal. If someone is always winning and always getting their way, they're probably not the person initiating divorce or firing. Yeah. Yeah. And one last point, Wendy, is something that you said earlier, that death by a thousand cuts, right? Mm -hmm. The accumulation of it allows us to get groomed and, comfortable as each step becomes a further deteriorating step. And so I think that's another thing I'd want our listeners to hear and heed uh, as they move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to give Sarah a huge thank you and also to tell everyone to please tune in to her podcast toxic person proof podcast and then check out her book becoming toxic person proof sarah again thank you so much for joining us today marcia i'm gonna let you wrap it up yeah and sarah i hope i get i hope i get to see you in a few months when we finally graduate your class so. yes. <laughs> well we still need to get a time for you to come on my podcast marcia so well, that, that, that's we'll right too. Straight off. you can talk about your new book We'll, we'll figure out all about that. But I, too, want to thank you because I think the work that you're doing and, and making the complicated simpler for people to eat that elephant one bite at a time or whatever, you know, analogy you want to use. Keep telling your stories. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be the pig or the wolf. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, and, and nor do I want to read that story again and again and again. And so I, I love the provocative uh, nature of that. And I love your analogies and stories and the language that you bring that enables people to see things they couldn't see before. So thank you very much for being here and being a part of our podcast. Yep. Thank yes. you. So thank much you for having me. And thank you, listeners and viewers, for joining us today on this Your Authentic Path to Powerful Leadership podcast with Marsha Clark. And please check us out on everywhere that you listen to your podcast and share, download, recommend this podcast to your friends. Um, check out Marsha's website, MarshaClarkAndAssociates.com for information on everything that's going on in Marsha's world. And you can also see how you can get a copy of her book. And uh, we look forward to, you know, doing this again next week. We do. Uh, let me add my thanks to our listeners. I hope you found value in today and that if there is some something that's on your heart or on your mind about all of this, please 
please go get help. Uh, use us as a resource if you need to. Sarah, myself, Wendy, whomever. And uh, because we really do want to... Uh, this is about, a, I want to live in a world that values women and girls. Yes. I mean, that, that's a hashtag that I use all the time. And and this is a part of that, is, is. is being able to identify toxic situations and, and, dare I say, get the hell out of there. That's right. <laughs> so that's, that's right. kind of where I want to f- say about all of that. And I, and I also think that this is a place where uh, us supporting and hearing the stories, believing the stories that other women have to tell is, a, again, a perfect link to my sign-off, which is here's to women supporting women. 